This is the API Intersection, where you'll get insights from experienced API practitioners to learn best practices on things like API design, governance, identity, auth, versioning, and more. Thanks for tuning in to the API Intersection podcast. Uh, I'm joined today by my co-host, Adam Duvander. Uh, Adam, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, thanks, Jason. Yeah, I have been in the API space for a while and work with API companies to reach uh, developers, primarily externally. And I think a lot of those same concepts can be used internally to, uh, to engage your own developers. Yeah, Adam's a bit of a API content wizard. Um, so we're, our guest today is Matthew Reinbold. Uh, Matt's kind of been all over the place at a variety of different Fortune 500 companies. Uh, Adobe, FedEx, Cricket, uh, kind of worked on various programs there. Um, currently at Capital One, uh, but we're just kind of looking big picture at some of the things he's done. Um, obviously, within the scope of the show, you know, we're always looking at this kind of design being at the center of all things, but governance and all the kind of things around that. Um, but Matt, I think most importantly, we wanted to start off asking uh, a question that I hope you get a lot, uh, or that maybe I just, you know, I should know this, but I don't. But you say that you write about socio-technological. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Sorry, I said, uh, when you talk about common questions, it's where's the remote, right? Oh, right, right, right. No, I, I wanted to know <laughs> when you write about socio-technological electroblaborgabarism, what is that? Close. And how do you Close. say it? Yeah. Close. <laughs> socio-technical <laughs> electroblaborgabarism. Wow. Um, so, yeah, I, I figure um, for every decade that you're in the industry, you should be allowed to create a word. Um, and that was, for me... Uh, Electroblabagabarism. Uh, Sociotechnical dates back to World War II and the studies that they did trying to figure out how to make people and technology work better together. And it is uh, something that within agile and architecture spaces, it's reemerging as a as a uh, principle and something that we're rediscovering um, in order to make technology more effective. Electroblabagabarism is is a wholly owned creation of Matthew Reinbold. Um, and it's just, it's a fun, made-up word. Again, electro kind of ties back to technology. Blabber gab, it's talking about stuff. And then gasm, it's its fun. It's exciting. So <laughs> put all together, you get uh, socio-technical electro blabber gabberism. And the reason I write about these things is long ago in my professional career, I felt that the technology stuff was almost incidental. And I say that as a former developer and architect. It was really the relationships between people and the relationships between systems that made success or failure happen. And at that point, then I started looking more at these higher level, higher order concerns and making up my own words. <laughs> I love it. Uh, so I, I'm often described as the summarizer. So I would summarize that as saying that you take uh, great joy from the kind of cultural aspects of transformation. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It's, yeah, the, it's the tricky problem. It's the hard work. But uh, if you can get it to work, uh, you have some phenomenal success. Do you feel like across these different organizations that you've worked with that people were prepared for that? No. No, it, it's still something we're, we're trying to figure out. Uh, we are really at the stage in the API economy or the API industry where the rubber is starting to meet the road. The, the C-suite or the executives are starting to understand the importance of APIs in their organizations beyond just uh, architectural output. But uh, we consistently see in surveys and research that a large majority of digital transformations, including API transformations within companies, continue to fail. Yeah. And so it's it's trying to then understand the human element of change and how to make that applicable. Um, anybody who's dealt with APIs probably has heard of Conway's Law. Uh, Conway's yeah. Law is just one example of the ramifications of technology with people. And, and, and the old that's, adage that's of, my, 
Go ahead. The, the old adage of Conway's law being that if you've got uh, one team and you're building a compiler, you end up with a one-pass compiler. If you have two teams, you have a two-pass compiler, meaning the software tends to reflect the organization. Yeah, you, sh- you no- ship your org chart effectively. Right, right. And this notion of the inverse Con- Conway maneuver, of which I am also a big subscriber, is that you intentionally design the organization based on customer-centric software. So in other words, you sort of build your architecture in a customer-centric way and let the organization evolve to fit that. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, and there's there's a host of these things. You, you can immediately jump to Hiram's law, which is any observed yeah. behavior, whether planned or not, of your API becomes something that at scale somebody depends on. Again, that's a human element. It's a human aspect of, of the way we work um, that, again... If somebody's not minding that human side, the technology side will eventually have problems. Yep. So interestingly, I you know, I, I always try to to zoom things back and forth, and I think my career is reflective of that. That I tend to go from you know the big sort of PayPal or Expedia group size places down to you know kind of smaller startups, and I'm always looking for like the, the concepts that are portable, and some of these you know big inverse Conway law and Hiram's law, we start talking like that. And it's like a lot of folks would go, hey, isn't that just big company stuff where like you have a huge organization to change and, mm. flat, you know, digital transformation? Like I don't need to transform my 50-person company. Um, what would you say like, you know, right. you've got to walk in and start from scratch. What are the the kind of principal things that you think are, are portable across virtually all company sizes? I don't know, it's a huge, uh, definitely, a huge bucket. Definitely, I would say, <laughs> <laughs> well, let's let's start with probably something that most developers didn't have a class for in their CS studies, empathy. Um, hmm. We don't have enough empathy, not just in API design or technology, but the world in general. Uh, if you quickly open up your newsfeed reader and scroll through, especially our recent history, you'll see again and again stories where things have gone sideways because there wasn't enough understanding, care, and consideration for a party on the other side of a transaction. So bringing that back to APIs, whether you're in a small company or a large enterprise, whether you're a single developer or a product manager with multiple teams, having empathy for the end user, having empathy for the person on the other side is absolutely vital. Uh, Even if this is an internal API, it's never meant to be consumed outside the walls of a company. There will be somebody at the end of the day on the other end of that interaction. If you don't care for that person, if the API remains some automated output and it's somebody else's problem to comprehend and make sense and deal with whatever you're putting out there, you can get away with that for a while. But your ability to scale, your ability to um, uh, uh, have all the illities, uh, maintainability, grokability, discoverability, uh, will greatly be impinged because, frankly, the work was not done to care. And so empathy, they don't teach it. It's something that I've had to learn the hard way all too many times, but it's, it's something that goes a long way toward making an API better. So, uh, you know, how I would kind of translate that a little bit is like, especially through this course of more service oriented or, you know, kind of microservice architecture over the last 10, 20 years, is this process of uh, kind of designing a system and APIs are are sort of the the manifestation of that. But empathy is like the, the key thing to design, right? And is maybe what you're saying that for kind of you know, the, the budding software engineer learning that learning something about design and how we think about creating software and that kind of usability of what you build is actually in many ways more important than the sort of, you know, algorithmic precision or, you know, did it follow the right design pattern or that sort of thing. And in fact, I would argue design patterns are like, right. they're an anti-design pattern in many ways of comprehensibility. Um, when you talk about APIs, I mean, APIs essentially are an abstraction of complexity. And as software development has gotten more and more complex, what we've seen in organizations, large and small, is the necessity to hide more of that complexity behind an abstraction. 
many people have said it. I'll, I'll repeat it here. Complexity is neither created nor destroyed. It's just shuffled around. So that act of putting complexity behind an interface is an act of compassion <laughs> and yeah. care and empathy so that that consumer doesn't have to fill their headspace, doesn't have the, the comprehension overhead of understanding the bits and bobs and the, the horrible skeletons in the closet behind that particular um, piece of software. So, uh, you know, to, to move forward, we are going to continue to see more and more APIs within organizations, whether it's part of CICD cycles or moving to the cloud or the complexity will keep growing. So it's absolutely essential that we have compassionate designers in place that are able to continue to look at where are things getting too complex? Where is it too much of a, of a head job to, to comprehend what's going on here? And how can we safely store that, that complexity behind a well-thought-out, well-designed, well-maintained interface so that we can continue to get work done at scale? So for a technologist that hasn't had a class on design or on empathy, how do they even begin to know what needs to be abstracted, what needs to be hidden, and what, what parts to share? Uh, it, it begins with talking with people. Um, and unfortunately I've been one of those developers who's been like, oh, I have to pick up the phone. Oh, I have to go have a meeting. Maybe I'll just put something out there, and if they if there's a problem, I'll I'll hear about it, and then I'll fix it. I, I've been in that seat, and it is very easy. But oftentimes, the path of expedience is not the path of correctness, and so uh, it begins with with finding out who's going to use the thing, sitting down with that person, and listening to what they say and what they need, because what they say might try and solution the problem before you actually get there. Uh, Henry Ford famously said if he asked people what they really wanted, they would have said faster horses. Um, you know, there needs to be some some thoughtfulness in how you, you go about these things. It's, it's not like you're going to go to your integrator and get a bullet point list that you implement carte blanche. But um, it begins with having those conversations and then setting up the iterative cycles to get that regular feedback. This is something where doing like API design first becomes so powerful, uh, becomes much easier to change something when it's text-based and, and, and visible than it is like having coded the thing and going back six months later and finding out that you missed something fundamental. So being able to, to show something, get some feedback, incorporate the feedback, go back, mock it up, try it again. Um, getting into these virtuous feedback loops is absolutely essential. By the way, I, I apologize for what might sound like the Nazgul outside my window or perhaps a pack of hungry wolves. It's quite windy here today, so if there's weird howling noises, it's uh, I'm safe. It's okay. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I mean, bringing it down to earth a little bit, um, and by the way, I, you know, I think you and I have probably read each other's work over the years and, and seen each other's bits enough to know that like we probably agree on virtually everything we're at this level. Um, zooming it down though to like, I always want to put myself in the shoes of, hey, I'm a, you know, a more senior developer at a small place or maybe I'm an, ar an architect at a big place. And I know these things are theoretically possible, um, but I need to justify this. I have to say, hey, you know, I think we can do better with our APIs, whether it's internal or external. But, you know, some of the things you're saying is, well, we'll just sit down and have a conversation. Like, that's not going to be very convincing. No one's going to green like that, right? Or, you know, we just have to change everything about the way we think and work. Um, how, do, how do you think about, you know, <laughs> helping kind of put that strategic perspective together for somebody who knows what's possible but doesn't know how to explain it in business terms? Sure. Uh, well, obviously, if somebody approaches their executive leadership and says, we are going to change everything. Uh, alarms will go off. Uh, banners will start to unfurl. Uh, you know, lights will start to flash. Like that is a huge red flag for any leader who's probably already dealing with a tremendous amount, guaranteed a certain portion that you have no awareness of. Um, so 
don't do that. <laughs> don't start any initiative by saying we're going to overturn the the apple cart. We're going to burn all the ships for for now and all time. Um, starting small and incremental is absolutely the way to go. Um, be, going in anywhere and and proposing new behavior, new change is a skill. The the good news is is that it's a skill that can be taught. So in addition to starting small and incremental, you also need to be aware of of the system that you are acting upon. How do decisions get made? How does power flow? Both how that's stated formally and how it actually happens. How can your initiative make your manager and your manager's manager successful in that system? I guarantee that if you just walk into somebody's boardroom and says, do this because it's good for me or for some theoretical idea without connecting the dots on how it gets your manager to where they want to go, uh, it's, it's likely to be a very short conversation. So understand the, the system dynamics that you operate in. And when I say system, that sounds fancy. It sounds highfalutin. But it could be as simple as understand the hierarchy and, and where money comes from. Be able to connect your story of, of whatever change you want to make, whether that's API design first or uh, testing or, or uh, single gateway endpoint registration or whatever it happens to be. Tie that story to what will help the executive, what they're already doing. And there's probably an aspect of that in there. And then iterate on that because you're probably not going to knock it out of the park on that that first try, but continue to iterate on the story, continue to gather information about where the company is at and what the priorities are and, and how they want to proceed forward and continue to hone and hone and hone and hone and hone until your initiative is the business's initiative and vice versa. They're copacetic and all the leadership from top to bottom, everybody that you, you need support from that you need that accountable executive on board for is aligned and shaking their head and saying, yeah, absolutely. This is how I win. Yeah. It's interesting. Somebody told me once, um, you know, like I think spoken like a true architect, right? <laughs> Somebody who's got that background. Somebody told me once that like being a great architect is like, you know, being a little CEO or uh, being a little CTO, uh, but you're, you're selling ideas, right? Um, mm. What's interesting to me is is platform when we unpack what that means, which is usually the frame that this stuff comes to life in, right? Platforms are based on building a collection of APIs. That there's kind of two different sides to that world. I call it like the MIT version and the Harvard version of the world, uh, which is MIT is this sort of, de you know, decomposed modular systems. And then uh, the Harvard version is marketplace theory. Um, so in terms of like, that getting started, you know, where would you think about from, you know, talking to these business leaders? Are you justifying it on sort of start from the cost cutting measure or the sort of, you know, acceleration aspects of decomposing your system, which we all know is longer term, slow down to speed up? Um, or is it, you know, that there's some external factor that makes this compelling? And I guess out of the two approaches, which have you seen sort of get better traction to start? It's going to vary quite a bit by the organization that you're working in. Um, the, there, different stories resonate differently with different cultures and different people. So, uh, you know that that huge caveat out of the way. I am somewhat suspect of any cost savings story because what lies at the end of the cost savings is zero. It should be free, and uh, while it's it's Something that can show immediate benefits and is easy, easily quantifiable, you can get yourself caught into a nasty negative feedback loop where it's just expected that at the end of it, um, uh, you know, all the cost centers should be should go away because they're they're negatively impacting the bottom line. Um, instead, I much prefer pursuing lines of conversation that talk about the positive uh, capabilities that can be added, that can be um, presented to an organization. Um, 
and and some of that might be something as simple as shortening the the feedback cycles from uh, shipped software to when the feedback can be reincorporated back into the software. So we talked previously about APIs and hiding complexity. So in theory, if you're decomposing a monolith and you're creating a set of, of APIs that are abstracting complexity, now you've given those individual development teams some autonomy to ship new versions we can talk about versioning later, but shipping new versions and having speed and having the ability to to um, uh, take some control over their development pipelines and, and producing things. And in the process, being able to put something new out into the world for a new set of consumers, whether that's a product or experience, getting that feedback and then using that feedback to subsequently tailor the next version. That is quantifiable, that's demonstrable, and that can also be um, raised up to the, the C-suite to demonstrate this is what our API platform is able to deliver. It's this, this um, more agile, depending on how you use agile in your organization, but it's this, this more um, flexible and resilient type of approach to meeting marketplace demands. And the reason we can do this is because we've, we've taken this monolith where we all had to march lockstep forward and we've we've broken it into this this platform. But again, um, huge caveat, depends on your organization. Yeah, I feel like a big component of it is, and the difficulty for a lot of folks in, in typically engineering where these things can often be born, is understanding enough about how your business works to mm -hmm. know how to justify what makes sense to do first, right? Um, so like what is actually hurting in in kind of the execution of the business that this modular approach, this kind of, you know, decentralization of things um, and or the externalization, depending on which way you go, um, which one actually helps the business and, and how to justify that. Uh, I guess I'm just always empathetic uh, to the plight of folks who know it's good, but struggle to articulate how. And I was trying to kind of think about how to help them explain that. Um, well, and maybe a... Uh, going through like an example of of how you know you said that's quantifiable, like how specifically would an individual in a company who's wanting to demonstrate this, how would they quantify it? Maybe even initially to be able to bring and say, look, we've been working on this and we have increased it by this much. How would how would they track that? Uh, well, take for example again. Hypothetical, just throwing stuff out here. Take, for example, something that returns um, transactional information. So in order to enable a third party, you've probably got things like your authentication API, which may be a different development team than that team that owns the transactions data, which may be different than the team that um, does things like your security and your oversight, just making sure like for the California Consumer Privacy Act or CCPA that there isn't sensitive data that's going out, or maybe that maybe that team is responsible for tokenizing data. So in this simple example where we're just retrie retrieving transactions that have happened, we've already got three development teams doing vastly different things. So we can measure when each one of those teams gets something into production and then that version of the API subsequently starts getting consumed. Now, we get that third party onboarded, we have a little party, and then subsequently three months later, that, that third party says, well, this is great and everything, but we'd like to increase the paging limit on the number of transactions because we have a, a, a model that maybe better is better is done as more of a batch. So we want a hundred records on our pagination. So the 25 that you currently have designed for. Okay. Well, that, that, uh, authentication and login team is not impacted by that. And that, that tokenization team, they might see a bit more volume because there's more records going out per request, but they're not changing anything. But now that transaction team goes back into their API and they're able to tweak the little bits, put that new version into production and subsequently then whenever that third party is able to then start consuming that new version, now they're successful. Now, those the time in which the, 
the versions get onto your production environment and the time in which the team starts consuming those, those are what I talk about when I say they're quantifiable. And that is something that you can go back to the business and demonstrate, hey, we have this pipeline by which we're getting features and functionality. This request was made here. We're able to respond to the request. We're able to get that back out. Oh, and by the way, that didn't stop those other two teams, the the tokenization team and the authentication team. They were able to continue to build out their own set of functionality because they were unblocked. And that's something that, for example, we weren't able to do before when we had our monolith or when we had our one team or whatever. So um, that's that's the example that's on the top of my head. Yeah, nice. Yeah, and I mean, it's, it's funny. Um, it always comes down to like the storytelling factor, right? We talk a lot in Agile about, you know, tell the story and that, that you know, and it'll make sense. But um, it's interesting because, uh, you know, I would frame what you're describing as kind of in that cost cutting measure of how uh, folks t- typically want to kind of frame these things is like, what's the outcome? The, what's the business outcome of that story um, beyond? And, and I guess what you're describing is kind of time to market in that particular scenario. Um, but like, what are the other factors besides, you know, potential sort of, uh, you know, not missing opportunity cost kind of thing, you know, time to market stuff. Are there other sort of, you know, innovation or, you know, those other kinds of opportunities that factor into that storytelling that, you know, gets latched onto? Uh, certainly. Uh, so when you talk about innovation, being able to, for example, take your um, legacy data center storage, if you have an API that allows for documents to be uploaded, and being able to swap that out for something cloud-based because your abstraction can continue to operate, but meanwhile, you're you're doing something better in the background and again that maybe that's a cost saving story because um you're going to the cloud but maybe there's some innovative bits because you're able to now subsequently um uh, because the, the you have centralized storage you can run different automation or scanning or something like that over over the cl- cloud based things um as far as other stories for how to move the needle when it comes to um, API rollouts. Uh, again, it, it goes back to what are you trying to accomplish? Are you a developer? Are you a product manager? Are you a um, architect? Like what 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 are you trying to accomplish within your organization, and at what scale are you trying to do it? Yeah, again, good architect answer. Depends. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right. I, I guess uh, shifting gears, let's let's presume that you know our our listeners have had some success and and have some kind of program. And you know, in a smaller company, program is probably not a word used, but uh, you know, we've got some way of doing things and building APIs. And we presume that in most cases, this is framed around whether it's called microservice or not. That there's multiple teams building. Uh, different functionality and different APIs that we want to come together and feel like one thing. And dare I use the G word, governance becomes a thing, right? Um, what do you think are like the the fundamental building blocks, um, you know, to getting that ball rolling? And I know you're going to give me a depends answer, but uh, I'm certainly want, uh, I'd love your <laughs> like, what has tended to work out the most? <laughs> So, so how do you start a governance program? Um, the The first step is identifying what what pain or problem you're trying to solve. Even in your question, you you talked about microservices, and I would be willing to bet that if you talk to four people in your organization and ask them what microservices are, you'll get six answers. It's it's ambiguous and people probably have some definition in their head, but nobody's taken the time to go ahead and make it explicit. Governance for me is not the rules or conditions or policing of an organization. Governance for me is how we relate to each other 
And a big part of how we relate to each other is our language. So you can start a governance program simply by by establishing a community of practice. Hey, I'm creating APIs. You're creating APIs. How about we get together on Friday? Before In the before times, this would be over lunch, but now it's probably over Zoom. But let's get together and let's, what's your definition of this? What's my definition of this? And let's see if we can establish some common ground. And for many small, maybe even mid-sized organizations, that's probably enough. Because through the course of those conversations, you'll hit upon things like, should we have a standard error object? Would that make things easier? Could we actually build some kind of uh, framework that takes action based on certain things that come back in that error handling? Huh, yeah, maybe we could. Okay, let's let's think about that. Um, you know, those kind of informal conversations that, that occur naturally – uh, because that forum or that expectation was created might be enough for your organization. As you get bigger, as you have more geographical locations, as you get more development teams all trying to row in the same direction, it becomes incumbent to have a formalized group to help make those relationships and those activities explicit. The, the role of governance is as much about creating those forums and making sure that those conversations are happening as they are the actual creation of a style guide or the creation of whatever monitoring system uh, that's put in place. I have so, to note that that when you talked about uh, just at the very beginning, you know, in the before times, it would have been lunch. It's been like a year since this COVID <laughs> thing started. And it feels like, you know, the before times, like remember when <laughs> it's been a very long year. <laughs> Anyways, Adam, I didn't Absolutely. mean to interrupt. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I was going to say a lot of times when people hear governance, they think of rules and enforcement, and it sounds like maybe it gets there eventually, but when it gets there, it's not through some czar's rule, but but rather, I mean, maybe take us through how <laughs> how it gets to that end and maybe maybe how to avoid someone thinking that when they oh, hear governance. It's absolutely understandable. Um, and I will say, even when I started down the path of small G governance, it was kind of pursuing what I think is most people's expectation of what governance is. And the reason that happens, the, the reason that you have the kind of hierarchy, command and control, top down, do as I say type of governance the, or, or something akin to the the Department of Motor Vehicles is is because it's the simplest to roll out. Somebody has given me power and I am going to use that power to tell you what to do. And so whether that's formal hierarchy, whether that's a recognized center of excellence, whether that's that's something within an organization, it's the simplest and most straightforward to roll out. Uh, Jason, you look like you wanted to jump in there. No, no. Squirming. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> well, it's an uncomfortable conversation. Squirming is understandable. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Every time I say governance, people squirm. It's it's just instinctive. Yeah. Well, and it's also the thing that we hate about ivory tower architects. You know, they they sit in in the clouds and they come up with some new thing, and it's handed down from on high, and people are just expected to follow lockstep, like lemmings. We have had so much happen in the software development culture in the last two decades that has been all about empowerment, all about independence, that to continue to have these kind of governance structures, you can you can understand where the friction then comes from. These are people that enter your org with an identity of being a highly paid, highly sought after professional. And then all of a sudden they're confronted with a group that tells them, no, we know better. So these were some of the, the the things that I was wrestling with as I started trying to do governance and trying to deal with APIs at scale and 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 meeting some of that resistance. Uh, that that put me down a path of okay, obviously we need some mechanism to make sure that we're creating consistent and cohesive behaviors, but simply telling people do this, don't do that 
or I'm going to get out the executive hammer on you. Uh, that wasn't meeting the bar. And so then, then that's when I started down the path of more collaborative um, examples from across the industry. Things like communities, communities of practice, things like the virtuous feedback loops, things like engaging stakeholders and co-ownership of standards documents, things like coaching and training before um, you know banning and shaming. But you did mention in there that you know this notion that at some scale you've got to have a team who's kind of in charge of getting these things defined, um, and so you know that sometimes the notion of we're going to define standards is in itself you know an anathema to this kind of shift toward decentralizing and making things community oriented. Um, so I guess one uh, you know sort of backing up what kinds of things you would expect uh, a team to define and how do they sort of help, you know, get that rolled out in a way that right. sticks. Yeah. Tying back to what we were talking about earlier, it's imperative, absolutely vital to start small. Um, if you say that, okay, it's time for standards. We're going to write all the standards for all the groups for all time. It's going to fail. It's going to fail because your governance needs to be as adaptable and evolvable as your organization. So there, there is no chiseling into stone. There is no solving everything for everyone because that is a constantly moving target. If you are entering governance with the idea that you'll be done, <laughs> that's the wrong way to think about it. You're only done when there's no more organization. It is an evolvable process. So then stepping back, okay, how do we roll this out? Well, step one, let's find one pain point that is universally understood and that is non-controversial, like just obvious. And then let's establish, let's figure out who are the people that need to be in the room? Who are the people that care? Who are the people that are going to show up? What is our ratification method? Is it just whatever is elevated and somebody makes a decision? Do we have Robert's rules of orders during a meeting? Do we do some kind of majority rules type thing? All of these things, those are the aspects of governance that often get swept under the floor in the pursuit of, hey, let's get that tangible object, that standards doc. But once you once you get that that process and the stakeholders and the understanding of how this thing is going to happen. Maybe you're capturing things in an architectural decision record, which is great. Do that one small slice. Do that one uncontroversial thing. Get that approved. Get that out into the world. And then iterate as necessary with the understanding you're not going to be able to solve everything, but make sure that you're solving the thing that matters now. You mentioned, uh, well, so I, I think a lot of what you're touching on here are the things that most folks would immediately jump to is like, you know, you mentioned like a standard error object or, you know, do we use camel case or, you know, hyphen case or kind of all the the convention stuff. But you mentioned also like, you know, how do we describe kind of the language that we use to talk about these things, and which I find, especially in larger places, it's like, you know, that's the XPYNFD, and it's like customers have no idea what that thing means, and that kind of leakage to the world is what makes things horrible to use. Um, so do, have you kind of ever gone about describing these kinds of grammars or vocabularies as a standardized thing? Yeah, a, a great example, and, and you hit on it with your question, are abbreviations. And abbreviations, especially within a large organization, can be insidious. They lead to the reliance on subject matter experts. Like, I'm looking at this API. It's been documented, but I still don't know what it does because it's got all of these internal references to a system. I have no idea what it what's going on here. That's, that's the failure of an interface because now you're linking the implementation details out. Elon Musk, who's a decide divisive figure, and I, I won't deny that, but Elon Musk famously at SpaceX said, we're not going to use abbreviations. Well, that that's great, but 
when you work in something like the financial industry, something like FICO score is a well understood thing in the industry. But if you had to spell out FICO in field names, it would be huge. So there, there is, there is some, some common sense or some pragmatism that has to be applied. One of the things that we adopted is we said, okay, well, no internal jargon, no internal abbreviations, but if you can Google the thing and it's in the top of the fold, then it's fine. That's a well-known industry thing. And you know, even though you may not understand or have heard of that thing because you've never worked in the financial industry before, the rest of the world accepts it as a thing. You know, you wouldn't ask a team to spell out AM or PM when talking about time. Like well known, well understood, let them be, let it through. So, you know, coming up with pragmatic approaches to that stuff, it, it takes a while, but you can do that. I, I love the above the Google fold thing. So does either of you know what AM or PM stand for? Anti-Meridian. Nice. I always forget that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. And then P-Meridian. I want to know what the X in SpaceX stands for. Yeah. I'm sure it connects to some <laughs> other <laughs> teaser game of, of uh, Muscovian acronyms. Uh, there's all kinds of fun theories about the... Uh, the progression of Tesla models, you know, um, yeah, the S, anyways. the S, the E, the X, and the Y. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> you said it, not me. Um, <laughs> so um, I'm I'm curious. Uh, oh, yeah. Go yeah, ahead. Go ahead. Adam. So I'm curious. You touched on sort of these terms and how they don't mean anything externally. And one of your examples earlier was a third party asking for more transactions. I'm I'm curious how you see sort of internal API usage versus this sort of partner to partner relationship, and how that changes all of this that we've discussed. If it does, uh, changes in what way? The in ways that you would approach in the management, in the design, in the. All of the above. Sure, in all in all of the above, yeah. <laughs> um, and maybe so, think through someone who ha- who is currently entirely internal, and they want to make a case for that external usage. How would how would they go about doing that? And how would they, yeah, sure work within uh, the systems they have? Right. Uh, so one of the common theoretical ideals that I have heard at more than one of the places that I've that I've worked is that you should design any API so that it could be externalized, you know, with a snap. So every single API created requires the level of expertise and effort um, that that a, a public facing API might. And while that's a nice ideal, in practice, what I've seen is it's it's a lot of resources for not a lot of gain. When we look at our internal API ecosystem, which now is about four thousand APIs at the at the enterprise where I work at, a vast majority of those are point to point connections. Um, it's it's a stereotypical long tail type of, of graph where, yes, they're providing value and they're getting work done, but they're never, ever going to be that platinum level gold-plated thing on the marquee. So it's important for us to have various levels or allowances for different types of effort. If this is something that is used or consumed only within a, a product team, well, we happen to call those microservices and we understand that perhaps that doesn't need the level of rigor around communication and documentation and all those things because that team is working shoulder to shoulder with each other and that knowledge transfer is very easy. However, once we start having things cross boundaries of a certain size or a certain level of difficulty, whether that's across the line of businesses or across geographical regions, now now we have more of a, a desire to place more rigor into the design and the articulation of the intent because you don't have that other person readily available. You can't just call them in 
uh, as, you know, and have a quick aside and figure things out. Um, when you talk about partners, partners are the, the biggest extreme of that. These are people in an entirely different organization. And in order to support them and have them be successful, you have to capture a higher degree of intent, gotchas, examples, documentation, service level agreements, all of that needs to be provided for them so that they aren't picking up the phone and interrupting your continued development life cycle for them to be successful. Um, you know, it's interesting on trying to draw that line of when you should and shouldn't apply that full acumen of external uh, externalization thinking. And I, I, you know, I, I've had the same experience as you It's like, you know, it's, it's a great idea. And I, I recommend it to everybody is like build, like you want to could externalize at any time, but in trying to find a line in there, I think in some ways it's, is this a word that customers would use that we would use to describe what this thing does? Right. So taking, mm -hmm. And having worked in kind of financial stuff myself, you know, digging into the belly of like risk management stuff, probably something that your average kind of typical customer or partner is maybe directly exposed to. And if they are, they don't really need to know the details of it. it just gives them a yes or a no kind of thing, right? Um, those kinds of things you mm -hmm. might not care as much about or maybe some compliance oriented thing. But when it's time to go, say, process a payment in a financial context, those things need to be like super comprehensible because that's like the first word on the tip of the customer's tongue, right? Mm -hmm. Well, and also understanding what is the unique differentiator for your company. So, for example, if your yeah. company's calling card is risk modeling, well, then that's probably the golden goose that shouldn't be exposed to external entities. So, you know, save yourself some time. We're not going to externalize this because this is how we make our money. It goes back to your previous comment, like their developers do need to be aware of how the business works and you'll save yourself a lot of time and, and, and tilting at windmills if you, if you do. Yeah. I, I also think back to kind of uh, Expedia group experience with how fascinating it was to figure out what a word meant. Um, so like across the tremendous number of brands and lines of business, you take a word like itinerary that you think would be fairly self-explanatory. Boy, it is not. Uh, what itinerary means in a car rental versus taking a flight versus any other mode of travel. Wow. Uh, and so I, I, I'm yeah. a big fan of kind of picking apart the language and making sure everybody knows what words mean before we go off and design something based around those words. And I think it's kind of the primal soup and this is, of, of API design. Yeah. Well, this is one of the things that has me so excited about being five years into having captured business intent in open API descriptions. We can look at five years of APIs and the language used throughout them. And now we're starting the process of using natural language processing and identifying these pockets, these common repeatable objects that are happening in various lines of business. We aren't there yet, but in my head, the vision is we get to the point where we are able to... Um, create consistent language usage, drive terminology consistency through the use of prompts in our tooling. So I start seeing somebody start typing that they're in the financial services group and they're going to do something with accounts. Well, similar to an IDE opening up suggestions for, for folks, um, you know, drop downs, they start getting what their peers have done over years. Like this is the language that has been ratified and reused throughout their group. And now they're starting to get suggestions. It's making it easy for them to use the language that, that has already existed within the organization. And that's where we are right now. That's really the, the next step for us. And what's so great about that is talking about empathetic governance that changes it from a consultation with somebody on my team where we have to wag our finger after they've already created something, go, no, 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 no. We call it this, not that. That's not a good experience for anybody, and it sets up an antagonistic relationship. Instead, during creation, it's in the tool. You get a prompt, and it's like, 
oh, this is actually making my job easier. I don't have to spend computational overhead. I don't have to spend brain time thinking about what do I call this thing? Because it's already been figured out before, you know, for me. And then subsequently, then my whole approval process is that much easier because lo and behold, that's what the organization expected me to use. So yeah, and really I, excited I think it's about also, that. It's, it's also empathetic to folks like yourself and, and jobs I've done before of, of being that, um, that reviewer who has to remember the whole lexicon and watch out for, wait, was that an address field? Did that use the globalization approved address model? <laughs> and then having to go do the homework on yep. that. Um, that's fascinating. So sort of reverse engineering your common objects from the existing things. Um, I guess kind of touches on another subject, which is like, all right, you have this catalog of existing APIs and you want to like unify things into a future platform. You know, do we just kind of skin another layer of archaeology on top of that and define new APIs that abstract away the old ugliness? Or do we just index the existing things that we have and learn and introspect about what exists today? Uh, both models are possible. Um, it de certainly depends. If you've got some backend system that has been the primary driver of some process for the last 20 years and nobody wants to touch the thing because who knows where the developer was that knows what that code base is, um, you know, there, there's opportunities there. It's probably not going anywhere. It hasn't gone anywhere the last few decades. So it might be worth the investment. Uh, I worked a number of years with James Higginbotham, and one of the great quotes that he he practically tattooed on my forehead was that um, APIs are the great enterprise do over. You know, you get you get to create a new abstraction on top of that old thing. That said, if that backend system is not some ten or twenty year piece of infrastructure. If there is chance that there's variability or it's going to be swapped out or something like that, there are other ways to provide the short-term win while subsequently working toward the, the longer-term solution. In our portal discovery, we have a number of tags that we use. We have a number of template disclaimers so that as, uh, as I'm going through and I'm searching for an API to use, I get more information about the state of this, I get communication that clearly tells me that maybe this is a bit weird and doesn't do things the way we'd normally do it. You know, here be dragons, but you can use it. And here's the roadmap. Here's the path for deprecation. So as a consumer, I have all the information before I go down that road. And more importantly, if I'm looking for examples or ideas on stuff that I should use in my design, I have it clearly articulated that, yes, this doesn't look like other things, but that also means don't copy this verbatim. There's a reason. This is a legacy migration. This is, a, um, you know, it was determined by an external third party that it needed to look like this. Like we, we have the ability to clearly communicate the expectations and when things deviate from those expectations. So I think you're touching on another assumption here, which is that regardless of whether you've designed the the new archaeological layer to hide the old sins or you've indexed what you already have or some combination thereof, that making that index sort of discoverable and visible to the organization is a thing, right? Mm, yes. Yes. Um, and I'm curious, like, when you think about, you know, kind of different scales of organizations, especially kind of smaller places where maybe you don't have tech writers on staff who can help kind of put together that documentation, um, you know, what are some practical ways that you would look at kind of, let's say, measuring the quality of documentation or kind of evaluating whether or not what you have works? Um. That's a great question. For a vast majority of our API portfolio, we do not have tech writers involved. The, the tech writers fall into that category of higher level effort, higher level of resources for 
the important use cases. A vast majority of the documentation is auto-generated based on an open API document. And the reason that that open API document is so important is not just because of the documentation, but it's also the machine parsable solution that then is subsequently allowing for automation on our gateway. So when something is, is approved through our lifecycle process, then that document is parsed, the endpoints are determined, and then subsequently registered with the gateway. So then the team is like, oh, well, now I just need to go in, take those endpoints, and connect them to my executable in the cloud somewhere else. All of that is, is enterprise-level solution. If you want something as simple as that shared spreadsheet, and I guarantee these exist, that shared spreadsheet of known resources that is handed to a new person on day one and told, hey, this is this is what you connect to. You need this, go to this spreadsheet. Uh, somebody needs to, to manually update those and they get out of sync or whatever, but that is a form of discovery. It's simple, it's straightforward. Everybody has a spreadsheet in some form and it can be the, your, your uh, MVP version for discovery within your org. Yeah, on some level, everything starts as a spreadsheet, right? <laughs> um, cool. Any, uh, I, I guess we've kind of run you through the gamut of, of topics here. Um, I guess any other sort of, you know, thoughts of wisdom on, again, my, my heart always being kind of uh, aimed toward folks who are trying to figure out how to get these things off the ground and where to get started. And gosh, this is all, sounds great, but like, you know, where do I get the ball rolling <laughs> Um, and, and I think you touched in there on some level of this, you know, kind of adoption matters. If, if people are going to use it, it's going to be important. And that's certainly a, a good driving factor. But, you know, there's standards and there's all these discussions and communities and all this stuff. How do I get going? Uh, um, I, I, I agree. It's it's I I. I know that people can quickly get overwhelmed. Uh, you know, for example, I had a uh, machine learning person reach out to me on LinkedIn, and they've they're a ten year professional. They've been doing AI for quite some time, but now they've been told they need to create an API. And it's like, where do you start? Oh my gosh! And unfortunately, our industry doesn't have the one way to start. You wouldn't point somebody to Fielding's essay. <laughs> um, so you know that is something that that I try to address with my newsletter. I write a, a newsletter several times a month called Net API Notes, where I don't try and be comprehensive. I, it's very much trying to only cover the best of what's out there and what what people are talking about, but. I'm I'm seeing little pop-ups about server connection. Are we still good? Yeah, I was getting that too. Yeah. I think we're okay. Yeah, that's now. strange. I was too. I I thought it was just me. <laughs> <laughs> um so as, as far as getting started, like uh, e I, I I think you're stumping me. Uh, the, this, the same, yeah. the, the, the same. I struggle place with I, this answer too. <laughs> a, a technical person would start is not the same place a product manager would start. Yeah. Um, yeah. I I'll do a plus one for Net API Notes. I'm a longtime subscriber, and for people who are really enjoying this conversation and what's uh, what Matthew is bringing, I would say subscribe there, and you will you will get the best of the API space a couple times a month. I was going to say every week. <laughs> uh, yeah, actually, I, 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 take, I take some weeks off. I'm not <laughs> like clockwork, unfortunately. Yeah. And actually, the aforementioned James Heggenbottom does a good job at his newsletter. Um, gosh, what's that one called? Uh, oh, Developer forgot. Weekly? I think. Yeah, I think so. Um, that's quite a great, uh, it's definitely been a guidebook for me for a long time to keep up on the latest yeah, I struggle too with this. It's like, you know, what book do I start reading that will teach me all the things? It's like, uh, I guess what I would suggest is, you know, and I think this is where you and I are, have a common approach is start with the discussion about what parts matter to the customer. 
um, what are the, the words that they hold dear? And that will lead you down the path of, you know, what's really important to think about making kind of clean enough to externalize some point in the future um, v- versus getting into first, you know, what's the, the what are all the mechanical kind of conventions that need to be there? There's so many ways now to kind of check for that stuff uh, to see if it's, you know, clean and decent enough. But it's to your point, if it's full of acronyms, if it's full of meaningless concepts to the customer, it didn't matter how good your conventions were. Right. Yeah, I struggle with this conversation because in my head, I immediately went to somebody struggling to decide whether they wanted a more conventional REST-ish interface or if they wanted gRPC or GraphQL. And Mm. in those conversations, people in the API space will talk themselves until they're blue in the face because it's detailed and it's nuanced and we love that. Um, But that's that's tremendously hard for somebody starting out. Yeah. So, you know, how do you, how do you, uh, you know, is there a flow chart <laughs> for your needs versus these different approaches and what are the pros and cons and what corners are you painting yourself into? Because, uh, as, as Joshua Block, uh, from Google famously said, uh, you know, a- APIs are forever, <laughs> Like you can version them, you can increment them, but effectively, once you have that first client integrating with you, you have loose coupling. Maybe not coupling, coupling, but you have loose coupling, and and so that will impede your ability to change. Is swapping out a GraphQL for a REST API is not a choice that can happen later. So how do you get started on that in something that's grockable for a newbie um yeah but i think in many cases i I need to think about that yeah i think in many cases it comes back to the same thing because i've been in the midst of those battles as well of you know a year-long debate over what format should we use and it's like you know pizza and beer can solve a lot of problems in software engineering and that is to say invite a group of people you think would want to use these and ask them what they want you know and just lure them with pizza and beer (laughs) <laughs> like, uh, and maybe that'll get you something that you can go POC and then ask them to try it and see which one they like and go with the customer's needs versus your, you know, sort of academic thoughts on the matter, um, which in the process will teach right. you what really matters to them probably isn't the form factor of the API, but more the, the content of terminology used in it and the, the relationships of kind of concepts to each other. That's a that's a great point, and it reminds me of a story from one of my first successful API deployments. We were wrestling with whether we do a SOAP or a REST-based API, and it was going to be consumed by a third party. And ultimately, after a lot of whiteboarding and, and gnashing of teeth and, and graying of hair, we went and we talked to that other person, and it was like, oh, yeah, REST all the way, you know, SOAP, you. And so, um, yeah, plus one on your your comment there. Go talk to yeah. your customer, find out what Which they is, want. Which is, I think, to, to bring it full circle on our discussion is back to that kind of empathy. And, you know, I kind of usually frame as customer centricity. Not to say, you know, the customer is always right to your Henry Ford quote, right? Don't just do what they ask for, but figure out, you know, what job they're trying to do <laughs> and, uh, you know, really understand it. Well, I think that makes for a uh, great closing thought for us. Uh, any other kind of parting words of wisdom for us, Matt, before we uh, say goodbye and thank you? No, this was great. This was great. If people want to um, talk about these things, uh, I'm very open and accessible. You can find me on my imaginatively named website, MatthewReinbold.com, uh, where you'll find uh, links to my Twitter, my email. Um, happy to keep the discussion going. Yeah, absolutely. And I would certainly encourage the listeners, uh, if you have more questions about these kinds of things, stuff you felt we didn't cover in whatever platform you're listening on, there should be a link uh, to allow you to go ask questions and we'll have follow up kind of bonus Q&A sessions. Uh, And certainly we can help reach out to, uh, you know, Matt to dig into some of these things if we didn't get uh, get to the point that you were looking for. But I guess with that, uh, Matt, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, Adam, thanks for helping co-host and asking yeah, smart questions as always. And uh, thanks everyone Great for listening. guys. Thanks for listening. If you have a question you want to ask, 
look in the description of whichever platform you're viewing or listening on, and there should be a link there so you can go submit a question, and we'll do our best to find out the right answer for you.